What does perfect even mean? Is there even such a thing? Oh, oh. Hey everyone, welcome back. This is the Ultimate Plague Star Farming Guide, and also technically a speedrun guide. We will go over all the best setups, builds, options, and requirements so you can farm as much Forma as possible, as quickly as possible before the event leaves. Just a disclaimer that since I've been working on this video before the event returns, this is based on older info accumulated over previous Plague Stars and some theory crafting based on new options since then, as now we have Helminth, Weapon Arcanes, Galvanized Mods, and new new augments. First things first, we're going to be doing full Eidolon Phylaxis and Infested Catalyst runs. If you don't want to spend all that time on stage 4, you can skip a lot of things in this guide, but I'm going to give a full guide, because if you follow this, it will be the most efficient way to always use all 4 Eidolon Phylaxes and 4 Infested Catalysts. You should reliably get 7-8 to eight minute full runs in solo or duo, and 8-9 to nine minute runs in full parties. Normally, Plague Star is done in 4-man teams. Eidolon Phylaxes and Infested Catalysts are consumable gear items you can use during stage 2 to increase the difficulty of the event. Up to 4 of either item can be used during stage 2. You use them from your gear wheel, which you can hotkey through keybinds for the event if you so choose. The game does not care whether one person inserts all 4 or if each person inserted 1 or if some inserted 2, some 1, etc. Basically you can insert for other people. You do not need to be near the mixer to insert, you can use them from anywhere on the map when stage 2 bounty starts. This implies you can carry people who have none of these. But generally it's considered common courtesy that each person inserts one of each at the squad intends to do a full run. Basically, decide with your team if you're going to use the Eidolon Phylaxes, the Infested Catalysts, or both. Eidolon Phylaxes blueprints are acquired from Nakak, so if this is your first time doing the event, you won't be able to get it from him until the event goes live. It requires 2,000 standing and costs Grokdral, Erudite, and Nissel Pods to craft. They are crafted 5 at once, meaning it will last you 5 runs if everybody inserts 1 themselves. If you're full carrying a squad and insert all 4, well, it'll barely last you more than 1 run. The Eidolon Phylaxes increases the number and level of infested that spawn in stage 4 of the bounty. Each Phylaxes mixed in will increase the mission standing by 25 up to a bonus of 1000 for all 4 Phylaxes. Infested Catalyst Blueprints are acquired from your Clan Dojo's Biolab. It costs Plastids, Ferrite, and Nanospores to craft. They are also crafted 5 at once. Infested Catalyst increases the number of Hemocytes that will spawn in that you must kill during stage 4 of the bounty. The number of Hemocytes that spawn are equal to the number of Catalysts you've chosen to mix in as a team. Each Catalyst mixed in will also increase the mission standing by 250, up to a bonus of 1000 for all 4 Catalysts. The mission has a base operation standing score of 1000 for completing it. You can get up to 1000 extra standing each by mixing 4 Phylaxes and 4 Catalysts, meaning the maximum score for a single run is 3000 standing. Unless they have changed the price of Forma, it should cost 3000 standing to purchase a fully crafted one, so one full run of max phylaxes and catalysts equals one forma. If you get good at using this guide, you should be able to run 6 to 7 full Plague Star missions per hour, meaning 6 or 7 forma per hour. For a simple chart on how using X number of phylaxes and Y number of catalysts affects the run, this shows the level of infested in stage 4 and both the number of and level of hemocytes that will spawn. Here's a screenshot of things to expect in the shop, but I know the main reason you're farming this is for the free forma. The other new item is the Ghoul Saw, which costs 4,000 standing per part, including the blueprint. The Ghoul Saw's new stance costs 3,000 standing, so this means 23,000 to complete the whole weapon, which is approximately 8 full runs. Exodia Contagion and Epidemic return as Zaw Arcanes. The first is your explosive melee projectile that's known for the insane damage it does, and Epidemic works like the current lifted status on slams, except it will work even on lift immune enemies. There are Plague Zaw parts I would also recommend grabbing, as the strikes give innate viral and you can also reach slightly higher crit or status values than normal Zaw parts. Aether Daggers are a solid choice these days, especially with their stance and sky high disposition. There are also very few ways to get Snipetron currently, so grab this at the very least for MR. The Fulmination mod sucks, we have Prime Fulmination now. Sacrifice also sucks. The Flares have very limited use these days, so I guess grab it if you want. If you learn the Cetus Wisp farms, it's faster than buying these, but it is an option if you don't care, as there's no daily limit on Plague Star standing. Don't buy the two gems or fish parts, as thumpers drop these by dime a dozen these days on the planes. 
I will very, very briefly go over the structure of a Plague Star mission here. The operation is split into a four stage bounty. To start the bounty, you talk to Konzu. In the first stage, you will have to go into a cave at the right, left, or upper left areas of the map. These caves are generally fixed and tied to the two and a half hour bounty rotation, so you will always get the same cave for that rotation. You will have to head inside and grab a Thrax Toxin Canister from the Grenier. These are the larger caves, so it can actually take a decent trek to get there when you're inside. Once you have gotten it, you have completed Stage 1. Now the game will identify a closed cargo truck somewhere on the map. The person that picked up the Thrax Toxin will have to fly there, activate the truck console, and insert the Thrax Toxin into the mixer inside of the truck. Now you have to defend this for 3 minutes. During this time, increasing amounts of Grenier will spawn in, and they're aiming to destroy it. This is also the window where your team can insert up to 4 infested catalysts and or Eilon Phylaxes. After this 3 minute defense, you complete stage 2 and someone will have to pick up the mixed toxin. A drone marker will spawn on the map. For stage 3, the person with the toxin needs to head to the spy drone and insert said toxin. This will then become an escort mission towards the big boil in the center north of the map. Basically just keep the drone alive. Once you get there, stage 4 begins. Begins. You will have to kill Infested to increase the purged control bar depending on the number of phylaxes and catalysts you inserted in stage 2. This will affect the level of the Infested in stage 4 as well as the number of hemocytes that will spawn at predetermined purge percent values corresponding to this table from earlier. Once you have reached 100% purged and killed the last hemocyte of present, you can extract. The hemocytes drop hemocyte systoliths that are used to craft the dojo statues for the event. Hemocytes have a chance to drop the Hunter set mods with Hunter Munitions being the highlight. Hunter Adrenaline is also useful as a better Rage mod and Hunter Track for niche status builds. The rest of the Hunter mods suck. So let's get into the builds. Frame and weapon options have been chosen to minimize the time spent on the operation. Most notably for speeding up the drone escort in stage 3, the DPS checks in stage 4, and to a certain extent mobility for stage 1 and the potential to AFK in stage 2. First, I will touch on solo or duo, as the frames used for Plague Star are roughly split into mandatory frames and optional frames. The solo and duo category for speedruns, of course, will consist entirely of said mandatory frames. This includes Volt and Nova. The build explanations won't be as in-depth today since there are a million things to cover, and instead I will give you sample builds, what we're aiming to accomplish in each, and why said frame is important. So let's take a look at Volt first. Volt is marginally slower than Nova overall, but is significantly easier to use. He also brings better survivability and damage buffs if needed. His speed buffs is also shareable and much friendlier than Nova portals for both getting used to and for your allies to benefit from. He is one of only two frames that can currently buff Archwing's speed, the other being Wisp. We are building him for range and strength and not completely trashing efficiency. We have replaced his one with Rest and Rage. We have picked a bright primary emissive so that we get the day form of the ability. The only purpose of this ability is to speed up the Hemocyte spawn animation coming out of the boil in stage 4 because you cannot damage it until it's completed its animation. You can just aim at it and cast this. You can also yeet it out with Bone Widow, Elytron's 4 nuke and numerous other things but it will still play its full spawn animation and not speed it up, so those methods are useless. The only way to speed this up is with Rest and Rage or Speedva, and well, Speedva uses up a frame slot. His 2 is a simple, obvious speed buff for Archwing. That's about it. Because we're on a range build, it can also be shared with teammates and now has a 60 meter cast radius. His 3 Volt Shield will protect you from frontal fire, but it will work as our main damage buff against the Hemocyte, boosting your damage with electric and multiplying your critical damage by further 2 times. You can even carry this shield in Archwing, so technically hitting the Hemocyte heads is easy. Basically, you just carry the shield around and shoot at the Hemo. His 4 benefits from both range and strength, which we are building for. When a Hemocyte is active, the Purge Percent meter in Stage 4 will not increase, so you don't want to kill adds until the Hemocyte is dead. But more Infested keeps spawning in, so you'll have a pile of Infested around after the Hemo dies. Basically, after you kill the Hemo, you cast your 4, and all the Infested instantly die, and your Purge Percent bar will bump all the way up to the next checkpoint that spawns another Hemocyte. You're in a loop of kill things, spawn the Hemocyte, then cast your 4, spawn the next Hemocyte, cast your 4, spawn the next Hemocyte, etc. until the stage is completed. Every single build today will feature Prime Flow and Preparation because I don't want you to have to be dumping energy pads throughout these missions. The purpose of this video is to keep your runs short and easily runnable with as little investment and problems as possible. The other mandatory frame is Nova. This is a Speedva build with overextended and power donation to get my strength down to 10%, which is a 60% speed up on my Molecular Prime. 
This will allow the Hemocyte to spawn even faster than the Rest and Rage setup on Volt, which only had a 39% speed up. So speed buff remains the fastest way to speed the Hemocyte spawn animations. With such low power strength, the only way to buff your weapons is indirectly. Energized munitions will let you shoot the Hemocytes with impunity. You can shoot weapons into her too to kill enemies during the stage 2 defense or stage 4 purge phase. It's her main source of AoE and I would recommend high raw damage weapons, which Pyrana is perfect for. Alternatively, you can bring stuff like Tigris or Strofa to charge your antimatter drop in one shot. Her 3 portals is useful for getting around without relying on Archwing and making it through the cave in stage 1 to get to the Thrax Toxin faster. Alternatively, you can Void Dash, but this might cost you pads and is a little bit difficult to use also. It does take a decent amount of practice to get used to using her portals and caves, but she can also portal the drones forwards during the infested boil travel escort in stage 3 by standing to the left of the drone as it approaches and casting a portal. This is why we're building for some range as well. Finally, her 4 will be used to speed up the Hemocyte spawn which requires 10% strength and also scales the effect length over duration. This keeps her 4 lasting while and her portals also stick around longer. Now let's move on to the optional picks, which you will see more of in 3 or 4 man squads. Remember, these are build templates and ideas and not strict builds you must follow. First up is the classic Titania. She offers mobility and pistols that can shred the Hemocyte. She is a compromise of speed and damage, so you don't need to invest in weapons you may not own, and still have the speedy benefits of Voltanova, but lacks the capability to speed up the Hemocyte. The build focuses around Razor Wing Blitz. There are actually two build versions that we'll go over, one for solo and one for team. The solo build is a very chill run and is very similar to a Thermal Sunder Titania. You build for a lot of range, some strength, and some duration and efficiency. Essentially, it's pretty balanced, but we keep her 3 this time, which is unusual on Thermal Sunder builds, because you have already a lot of range and duration, which we can actually use to CC things in a massive area with Lantern, which is important for stage 2, as it lets you AFK a lot easier and it doesn't require to constantly kill everything. Efficiency and Energize keeps the drain on your Razor Wing down and lets you spam Thermal Sunder more easily to nuke stage 4. You will be using your 1 to give yourself stats immunity and stack your Blitz casts. And finally, obviously your 4 lets you shred Hemocytes with your pistols and fly around quickly. You'll notice most frames that aren't Vault will be running Sprint Boost and this is just to help with getting around faster, especially as all the other frames will be using Archwing and not Razor Wing. Her dex pixias look like this. The empty slot can be a primed expel infested. If you don't have that, Magnum Force works too. We go blast because we're actually always full stripping the Hemocyte since it has too much armor when it scales up. Blast has a 50% damage bonus against their flesh, and Corrosive has 75%. But secondaries have Prime T to charge, so you can actually get more damage by going Blast instead of Corrosive. Just make absolutely sure you're armor stripping though if you go Blast. I'll go over this later, but it can be done with Shattering Impact or Abilities. If for some reason you want to run Corrosive, just swap these elements out. In a Plague Star team build, she has no range and better duration efficiency. She also has higher strength to shred the Hemocytes even faster with her pistols. She's also gained natural talent. This is a mix of a speed run Titania and DPS Titania setup. I've thrown natural talent and pull over her too, because this is one of the fastest abilities to cast in the game. You just tap her two four times and now you have max Razor Blitz. Basically, your only job is to shred the Hemocyte in a team, so don't screw up. The builds remain the same for her pistol. Next frame is Loki. He's literally a gimped Nova and his only purpose is to switch teleport the drone in stage 3 and possibly buff your team. The switch teleport is done by placing a decoy far ahead, TPing to it, then switch TPing with the drone, and then repeating the process. It's easier to pull off the Nova's portals, but with practice both are reliable and having to constantly TP yourself though back ahead of the drone as Loki actually makes it much slower than Nova. You can have multiple Lokis on the team to bypass this issue, but that's what a single Nova can achieve, and she can also speed up the Hemocyte. This particular Loki is a friendly team buff Loki, with total eclipse and some strength to accompany range to help your teammates during the stage 4 purge. It is also technically useful for the stage 2 defense. His abilities are cheap to cast, so I've completely dumped efficiency. Besides that, nothing special. Mesa is your aimbot for stage 2 and 4. That's it. She's the laziest thing to exist and only contributes by killing Az. I've used this build that's very similar to my ordinary general purpose Mesa. She has dispensary over 1 to help your team if they need it during stage 2 and 4, but basically it's just kill Az with her 4 and if you get the chance, shoot the Hemocyte in her mouth with the weapon when it opens, preferably Pyrana Prime. Because her regulators cannot target the Hemo, they are to be used for Az which have armor and is thus modded for corrosive heat. Magnum Force can be swapped it out for Primed Expel if you have it. The final frame on this list is Wisp. 
Basically, she is a moat bot and a roar giver. She has relatively high strength and respectable range. She will increase team survivability, which honestly shouldn't be needed. And permanent haste moats anybody can walk over to get a movement speed buff, including for your archwing. Basically, she just helps your entire team get around faster if Volt hasn't already. Her shock moats can do some decent CC and mediocre damage in stage 2 and 4, I guess. Just make sure all your teammates are in range when you cast Roar. The massive fire rate buff she brings means this is essentially the only frame on the list that brings arcane precision instead of arcane velocity, but if you're choosing to DPS the chemo primaries, you should be bringing arcane acceleration instead for all frames. Her 2 is near useless for this operation, and her 3, while can't save you, most of the time isn't needed. Okay, let's move on to the weapon options. The Hemocyte is similar to Lephantis for damage reduction calculations. Remember the liches you've been fighting? Hemocytes were one of the originals for that. They have a similar mechanic going on. There are three layers of damage reduction present. Armor, which we can remove. Flat damage reduction, which we've also seen on Eidolons and we can't do anything about. And DPS attenuation based on damage inflicted in a window of time. Basically, the more damage you do, the less you will do afterwards. You've definitely felt this with the new Sisters of Parvos and Liches. There are a few ways to cheat the system. Eclipse is one of them. Sonar is another. Except if I recall, I don't think Sonar actually works on the Hemocyte, but I'm not sure. But the very big one is that damage is attenuated per multi-shot pellet. So each hit has a separate cap. This means weapons with innate multi-shot have a huge advantage since their damage is considered as individual pellets and not a collective total. Basically, a weapon with an 8-10 multi-shot can hit 10 times harder than a weapon with just one pellet, as each pellet is individually subjected to the damage calculation cap. Keep this in mind when considering other weapons not listed in this video. First, I'll go over primaries. Your topics are typically split into two categories, your AoE clears and the Hemocyte shredders. Most of the good shredders are actually pistols, so that's why we can have dedicated primaries to AoE clears if you want. This includes standard options such as Brahma or Kuvazar. Tenet Envoy works too and honestly just a bunch of other options as long as they slap hard and use an AoE. Basically, they're doing the same thing as a Mesa aimbot would. I don't have an endless list of these weapons, but the examples I can give are these two raw corrosive builds. The adds have armor sometimes, and we aren't stripping adds, so that's why AoE clears remain on corrosive setups. The other category are the primary hemocyte, shredders. You'll notice most of these are shotguns because of the multi-shot pellet count. The only non-shotgun rifle is actually Kuva Kortak on this list, and that is because of the gimmick where you can spam click the ADS to significantly increase the fire rate of the weapon while tapping mouse 1. I wouldn't recommend using this if you don't want carpal tunnel, but so far it is the only rifle on the list that made it due to the ridiculous firepower and innate multi-shot. Remember, these are just the meta options. You can use whatever you want, but if you want the easiest time, you can pick something on this list. You would mod it for blast similar to this because rifles have access to primed cryo rounds. Remember to full strip though, if you don't have primed cryo rounds, go for corrosive instead. The shotguns on this list are boar prime and bubonico as the top picks. They would use builds like this mostly in our build for corrosive because shotguns have access to both primed chilling grass and primed charged shell, so they can make both primed corrosive and primed blast. Other top shotguns to consider are Comb Phantasma, because it's the only beam that actually gets more beams with multi-shot, Kuva Hack for the alt fire to one shot ahead, and potentially Strun Prime, but I'm not sure yet. They would all use the same builds as shown here, maybe some tweaks here and there, but these are the ones with the right combination of base damage, multi-shot, and crit stats to shred the Hemocytes as they're completely status immune. Now let's try secondaries. These are the dedicated Hemocyte Shredder slot, if you have them available. They're typically built for blast since they're the only primed element as heat, but if you don't have prime heated charge, just go for corrosive. Remember to full strip always. Blast is only better when you have primed blast mods and no primed corrosive is available. The top of this list used to be Piranha Prime which uses this build. It kicks extremely hard and but I do have a polarity problem because of multiple builds so I've slotted secondary deadhead for the 50% recoil reduction instead of steady hands. I'm not sure if the deadhead headshot multiplier applies to the hemocytes but for Piranha in particular let's look at this corrosive build on the side. Just imagine this is Blast and I have the right polarities. If you can manage to slot steady hands on the Blast build, do it. The minus recoil with deadhead stacks and this setup has minus 95% recoil making the Piranha shoot like a laser. But stick to Blast if you're stripping. Another less accessible option but equally good is Tenet Detron. It might actually even surpass Piranha Prime because of the Kuva element stats. Its combination of super high base damage, multi-shot, fast reload and alt fire rapid dot make it very attractive as an option. These two sit at the top. Below that we have options like Kuva Brack and Twin Colmac. 
twin Roga also works, but it only has a two size magazine, so unless you are certain you can kill in two shots or you spend weapon slots to add more magazine, I wouldn't use it. It also has a horrible fall off and spread. Now come some alternative choices. First, we want a source of armor strip, especially if you're a solo or duo. Normally, this can be done with subsume abilities, namely Ash's Seeking Shuriken, or if somebody wants to take Nyx for Psychic Bolts, but if you're willing to give up your melee slot, this can easily be done with Vastalock. It strips 54 armor per shot, and the Hemocyte only has 175 base armor. So with 4 shots of Vastalock, it's fully stripped. If you don't have that, Sarpa also works well, but we'll take 8 or 9 shots instead, since it only strips 30 armor per shot. This is your generic armor strip build. The really important mards are on the top row of 4. Everything under that is to personal taste for various other reasons and isn't really important. Though Dispatch Overdrive can make flying to extract faster for the extra movement speed that does carry over into Archwing. Vastlock can actually double as DPS against a Hemocyte with a Corrosive setup alongside Prime Fever Strike, but this isn't recommended. Do not do this for Sarpa though, it is much weaker than Vastlock. If you choose to go Ability Strip, other options open up for melee. You can bring in Exodia Contagion Zaw to clear adds much more easily during Stage 2 and 4, or you can bring a Glaive setup to buff your secondary more to shred the Hemocyte. Glaive Prime or Zorus are probably your best options, as Glaive Prime kills through everything by Slash, and Zorus has the biggest AoE to kill trash mobs. Honestly, any kind of heavy throw build works, but the main purpose is to trigger Combo Fury, which you can use to set up before the Hemocyte spawns. This will give you twice the magazine size for your pistol and extra 100% reload, making shredding the Hemocyte a joke. Piranha Prime in particular really appreciates this because it stacks with a double magazine from the Ghost Piranha if you can nail 3 kills in one magazine. The Ghost Piranha will also become easier to proc because of Combo Fury doubling the base mag size. For your Archwing, you really have two relevant options. Either you go Itzal to stack Archwing Flight Speed, and this is done with Hyperion Thrusters, the higher innate flight speed of Itzal itself, Pilot Intrinsics 8, Amalgam Serration, and or either Volt Speed or Haste Motes, and Situationally Dispatch Overdrive. Or you can go Amisha, which can help for newer runners. Her 3 Warding Grace can slow down the Hemocyte by up to 80% at 160 strength. This is useful for when the mouth opens and you feel you need a bit more time to kill it before it closes. Once a head pops, because it's a channeled ability, you can just deactivate Warding Grace and it will be full speed again. For speedruns, this won't be of much use though, but this is an option to freeze the Hemocyte without having to dedicate an entire team slot to it such as Rhino Stomp if you're having DPS problems. This effect can also be replicated by Xenorix Temporal Void Blast, which will also slow it down, but the Hemocyte will eventually build resistance to this, so make sure you kill it. This is one of the reasons why Xenorix is the meta focus for Plague Star. Speedruns will not be using the Temporal Void Blast slow since you can't kill the head fast enough, but the Energizing Dash is still useful. Uneru's Sundering Dash can also strip the armor of the Hemocyte after dashing many times, but I strongly would not recommend doing this because of the so many ways to armor strip already. Necromex can be used for stage 4, and you can just Archibex everything for purge percent ramping, but honestly, it won't make a difference in the meta. The Hemocyte is most likely tuned against Archibex damage itself too, and you won't be able to kill it quickly with this. This is an option if you want to have fun though. Now, let's look at tricks for the mission itself. Stage 1 is the cave section. Normally a Volt or Nova will do this stage since they are the fastest at it. Nova is even faster than Volt, but the portals are a little bit hard to control down in the underground cavern. The rest of the team can honestly just wait at the surface, because it should only take 30 seconds or so to grab the toxin. Whether you're in a squad or solo, you can force spawn where the truck or drone spawns in stage 2 and 3. Copy this lock pin. If everybody stands here, then the stage 2 truck or stage 3 drone will always spawn at the closest point to the infested boil. This is mostly irrelevant for stage 2, but very, very handy to cut down time on escorting the drone on stage 3. Basically, if this is stage 2, just treat it as practice for spawning stage 3 in the right spot. What is important is everyone must make it to this location before the next bounty starts. If the entire team is not here when the next stage starts, the stage 2 or 3 objectives will spawn elsewhere. There's a lot of dialogue talking after stage 1 and 2, so you you will have many chances and time to get your team here before the next stage starts. Now, I will explain another technique called Nightwave Skip. This can only be done with by the host of the session. Remember this, doing it as client won't do anything. When you open the Nightwave menu, it instantly ends all transmissions in the game. This is important because some mission events are triggered by dialogue finishing. We can use this to our advantage by starting the next objectives quicker. The main use of this is for stage 1. Normally, Kansu talks for 5 years before telling you where the cave is upon entering planes. If the host Nightwave skips by doing this when he loads in, it will bypass all of Kansu's dialogue and instantly move on to telling you where the cave with the Thrax toxin is. This roughly saves 
you 20 to 30 seconds, I think. It's not much, but with how much you're going to be running this event for Forma, just think of how many minutes or hours even you will save by just skipping the dialogue before stage 1 starts. Also, this means do not ever skip the dialogue of a stage until you are ready for the next stage. This is extremely important for leading into stage 3. You need to be absolutely sure your entire team is at this rock. If they are not and you Nightwave skip, well, GG. You just forced an early stage 3 and probably the drone spawned in the wrong spot and now you have a long drone escort. Basically, feel free to use this knowledge how you will. For the stage 2 defense, Volts can place up Volt Shields on either side of the truck and essentially AFK. You could even place a Spectre inside of the truck if you really wanted to, but I wouldn't recommend doing this as it isn't needed. Titania can just cast Lantern with a big range solo build and AFK. The other frame choices, Loki, Nova, Mesa, and Wisp will have to be actively playing. Technically, Wisp shock modes inside the truck with range and Loki radial disarm every 10 seconds or so also works for semi-AFK. Everybody should head to the lock pin shown here for stage 3 early before it starts. The fastest runner should be the one that pulls the toxin from the mixer after stage 2. This means either Volt or Nova. This makes it easier for the toxin holder to make it to the lock pin in time. Do not use Titania for this duty as she drops the toxin whenever she goes into Razor Wing. Stage 4 is literally just spam your AoE, armor strip the Hemocyte when it comes out, and kill it with your dedicated Shredder weapon, preferably set to Blast if a Rifle or Secondary, and Corrosive if a Shotgun or Vastalock. That's all there is to it. Enjoy your 7-8 to eight minute runs. Cheers and good luck. This is the end of the full, complete, and speed run Plague Star Guide. If this is your first time watching, feel free to leave like or better yet subscribe. It would honestly really help my channel a lot and I'd really appreciate it if you did so. Let me know your thoughts down in the comments. Now go ahead and grab your Forma. 79.5% of you are not subscribed. I'm trying my best to get you new information out always as soon as possible like I've done with covering Sisters of Parvos and this Plague Star update. Stick around if you want to see interesting memes and builds on a nearly daily basis. I'm also preparing to get you new war info first once that drops. You don't want to miss out on any of that, do you? That'll be it for this video. Thank you all for watching and see you all next time.